Hello, and welcome to the ASEAN Spotlight Session on Sustainable Resilient Supply Chains here at the virtual 20th anniversary UN Compact Leaders Summit. I'm Bart Adesh, your moderator for today's panel, which will run for one hour from 10 to 11 a.m. Tuesday morning, Singapore time. The session will shine a spotlight on how SMEs and larger firms can work together to strengthen SMEs, making them more resilient in the face of future crises and help them fulfill their potential in contributing to the Sustainable Development Goals. Over the next hour, we will also discuss the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on SMEs in Southeast Asia and highlight sound practices of companies and suppliers, many of which are SMEs, in responding to the health and economic crisis and ensuring business continuity. We'll also explore innovative and collaborative actions between SMEs and corporations that will make sustainability initiatives for SMEs more feasible. Further, we'll look at ways in which businesses can make internal improvements to drive and to support sustainability efforts throughout their supply chains. By the end of the session, we hope that everyone tuning in will leave with a renewed sense of business leadership and motivation underpinned by the Global Goals and the UN Global Compact Corporate Sustainability's 10 principles to cascade positive change through their own supply chains and the communities in which they operate. Allow me now to introduce the session's four panelists in the order in which they will speak. Peter Newbor is the Asia Pacific President for DSM Nutritional Products, one of the world's leading producers of essential nutrients like vitamins, carotenoids, nutritional lipids, as well as solutions for the feed food, pharmaceutical and personal care industries. Vijay Israyan is the founder and executive chairman of the QI Group of Companies, a multinational conglomerate with diverse interests, including direct selling, real estate, education, retail and hospitality in more than 30 countries. Ho Meng Kit is the CEO of the Singapore Business Federation, the apex business chamber championing the interests of the Singapore business community in the areas of trade, investment, and industrial relations. Meng Kit has held a variety of senior policy and executive positions in the government of Singapore, including four years as principal private secretary to the then senior minister, Lee Kuan Yew. And Shahamin Zaman is the chair of the Global Compact Networks in Asia and the Pacific, as well as executive director of the Global Compact Network, Bangladesh. To kick off our conversation, I would like to ask each of our four speakers to share introductory thoughts on the session topic and provide some thoughts on how they see the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic an associated economic crisis on business in ASEAN. Let's first turn to Peter Neubauer, who represents a global corporation based in Europe and employing more than 20,000 workers in about 50 countries. Peter. Thank you, thank you, Bart. You mentioned uh, me uh, for my capacity in nutrition. Uh, actually, I'll speak here on behalf of the group of companies, uh, which is active both in material sciences and life sciences. We have two clusters. Uh, we're a company that continue to involve uh, DSM uh, in nutrition, health, and what we call sustainable living. Uh, our strategy is really around growth and value. Uh, we call it purpose-led, performance-driven. I think the em emphasis is really on the, on the purpose-led. Of course, we need to earn our living. Uh, it's, it's really the emphasis on creating shared value for stakeholders, all stakeholders, uh, including customers, shareholders, employees, and society at large. We call this also the triple bottom line, yeah? people, planet, and profit. Uh, globally recognized for, for doing well by doing good. Uh, our vision is really anchored about around creating brighter lives for generations, not only now, but those to come. Focus uh, domains clearly aligned with the sustainable development goals, be it nutrition and health as the first, climate and energy, and resources and circularity. And uh, yeah, sustainability and reinvention are truly in our DNA. We take great pride in having transformed our business over the last few decades from, from coal mining originally, so uh, exploiting a finite resource, 
to the company that we are today, science-based and very much focused on, on solutions that create a better uh, environment, which is science clearly at the core. Uh, how do we do this? We, we think about three uh, topics. We improve. So we look at our own footprint. How, how can, we, can, can we improve the footprint from an emission perspective, from a diversity perspective, you name it, uh, efficiency perspective? How do we enable? What do we do with our portfolio? How do we innovate? How do we use our science and innovation power to enable our customers and other stakeholders to, to, to help create a better environment? So it's all about innovating that portfolio. And the third, advocating. We ask ourselves clearly, what role do we play to advocate the, the only just cause? Um, proof points, um, I think, are, are, are clearly there. We have a very well-defined uh, sustainability agenda around how do we develop our audio. For example, we have a target of 65% uh, of our portfolio uh, needs to come from solutions that are superior over mainstream solutions for people, both for people and planet. And also um, well-defined uh, targets around uh, an energy, a renewable energy, circularity, and what have you. Let me leave it there for now, Bart. Thank you. Peter, thanks for that. I, I took note of your description of DSM Nutritional Products as a firm that focuses on areas aligned with the global goals, namely nutrition and health, climate and energy, uh, resources and circularity. It was also interesting to hear a bit about uh, your company's radical transformation into a science-based company where sustainability is integrated at the core of your business strategies. We next turn to VJ, who can speak from the perspective of an entrepreneur who built a medium-sized multinational enterprise now operating in several sectors. Over to you, VJ. Thank you, Bart. Uh, the last few months have been truly a challenging time for all of us, and in particular so for, for us as a group. Uh, we began some 22 years ago, and uh, we have been uh, building our core business, which has been e-commerce, and we have direct selling and entrepreneurship, leisure, education, uh, and this has been the businesses that we have built now worldwide, as you say, over 30 countries. Um, the thing that uh, I would like to basically elaborate upon is from 1998, which is about the time we began, the same time as Amazon, Alibaba, and the like, uh, we we built our business on the on the basis of e-commerce. But it has been always been something that we have worked in partnership in tandem with traditional marketing styles. And uh, the you know front end of the business has always been direct sales, traditional marketing, and the like. And this we have done over some 80 odd countries stretching all the way out to Central Asia and Africa. And we have currently somewhere in the region of just under a million uh, people in the, in the database of customers and up to 20 million people that we have sold products to over the last 20 years. Now, the, um, the thing that challenges most in the last few months in particular has been the transition from a, from a hybrid uh, marketing uh, experience to a totally digital internet-based experience. And this is something that uh, we have both been surprised with and welcomed. So this has been um, our growth over the last uh, 20 odd years. In addition to which, I think uh, I'd like to be able to say that being in Malaysia, in ASEAN, where we, our operational headquarters is, we began in Hong Kong, but eventually move, we moved over to uh, the operational headquarters, moved back to KL about 15 years ago. Has been a very unique experience because ASEAN is in essence a, a center of growth all by itself with some 600 million people and um, a wide range of uh, uh, languages, cultures, and all of that. So Malaysia being a multicultural nation has helped us uh, trans, you know, transcend that and take it to a global platform. So working in Malaysia has been something that has been a blessing to us in a sense. And being Malaysian myself, I, I welcome the chance to come home, so to speak. So um, I'd like to pass that back to you, Bob. Thanks, Fuji. Uh, a little bit later, I'd be interested, in, and I think we all would be, to hear a bit more about how you see 
uh, Malaysia uh, dealing with the crisis. And also your reference to going digital. That's something that a lot of us uh, in, in, in our companies or the companies we interact with uh, have had to do in the last few months. And um, what, what that means for the post-COVID era, uh, whether there will be more work done digitally, working from home, that sort of thing, and what implications that might have for uh, the main topic of today's session. So at this juncture, I'd like to invite Menkit to share his initial thoughts. Menkit, how, how do you assess the economic shocks suffered by businesses in Singapore and let's say Southeast Asia more broadly and how companies are managing the reopening of economies? Uh, thank you, Bart, and uh, all my fellow uh, panelists. Uh, good day, everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about uh, Singapore because I, obviously I'm more familiar with the situation. Uh, we, you know, you mentioned SPF. Uh, we are the largest uh, apex chamber. Uh, I think we represent about 15% uh, of all uh, businesses in Singapore would be our members. So roughly about 80% of them are small and medium-sized enterprise. So we do have uh, large companies as well. We are a general chamber, not a specific uh, industry chamber. So we uh, represent a cross-section of industry. So uh, I think this uh, COVID-19 has caused, a, uh, I think, a severe contraction of the Singapore economy. Uh, I think why? Because because uh, there's huge demand drop uh, and also uh, supply restriction. So sectors that uh, uh, heavily impacted would be like tourism, uh, aviation, hospitality, and many of them are, are members. Uh, they they are badly affected. Uh, occupancy in hotels are very low, single digit. Uh, very little bookings ahead, and also. Uh, uh, for example, you you probably have monitored in the news, uh, in the news that every year uh, we hold uh, the F1 uh, street circuit race in Singapore. Uh, it's a night night race, and uh, this has been cancelled this year. Uh, and uh, with it, it's uh, about three hundred thousand worth of uh, business uh, uh, people who attend, and all sorts of uh, related uh, spending. So that's cancelled, and also because of the uh, uh, social distancing and lockdown. Uh, in domestically, so sectors like the uh, food as well as uh, retail uh, has been uh, severely infected, uh, impacted. Therefore, Singapore is uh, targeted to face its worst recession since uh, independence. Uh, we are likely to drop between 4 and 7% of GDP this year. The consensus from uh, economists is about 5.8% drop in uh, GDP. So what are the challenges for our companies? I think whether you're a big company or a small company, uh, they face a, uh, this kind of challenges. First of all, there's no top line, no more, no more revenue. And, and therefore, companies are affected by costs. And these are mainly, uh, for most of our companies, wage costs as well as uh, facilities and rental costs. And there's also been a disruption to the supply chain. Uh, two aspects. One is labor. Uh, we depend uh, on about 30% of our uh, labor force is foreign labor. So uh, because of the travel restrictions, so there's a restriction in the uh, labor supply. Uh, workers from China could not come back. Uh, professionals who have left uh, Singapore for, for holidays could not come back because of the lockdown. So that's one, one aspect of the, of the uh, disruption. And secondly, uh, raw materials and intermediate goods because of uh, whether it is export restriction or basically slowdown of, uh, at, at the borders as a result of uh, added, added checks. So, so these were the challenges faced by the companies. Uh, thankfully, government has responded uh, very strongly through four budgets and very uh, decisively. Uh, they put in a lot of money, uh, uh, a fiscal measure, uh, fiscal measure totaling about 93 billion Singapore dollars. It's almost 20% uh, of our GDP, and we had to uh, take about 52 billion from from our reserve. And these were mainly used to support uh, workers and to save jobs. So a lot of it goes directly to companies uh, in terms of uh, wage support for companies, especially. Uh, during the circuit breaker uh, uh, period. We had our own version of our lockdown. 
over two months in April and May of a circuit breaker. I think we just came out of it in early June, and I think the uh, circuit breaker has succeeded in, I think, managing and reducing uh, community spread in in uh, in uh, Singapore. So we are opening more uh, this weekend. We are we'll open shops, we'll open retail. Uh, I think almost 100% of our economy will be reopened. So that is a good thing. Uh, so what what will what will happen really is that uh, I think the priority of businesses will shift. Uh, it will shift to how do we operate safely. That's one. Number two is uh, so far uh, unemployment has been managed largely because of the government support. So uh, now we will need to look at managing unemployment and and retrenchment. I think which which. Uh, which is uh, still forecasted to go up because supply has uh, the demand has not come back, and the third thing is uh, uh, what what has what has the crisis taught us uh, in terms of uh, what business models would would need to change and how companies needs to transform. So these are the sort of the mid mid to immediate sort of issues that companies will have to deal with. Uh, I, and I think uh, uh, not just in Singapore but also many of our companies they have. Uh, international sort of uh, operations, particularly in the region, uh, similar sort of courts must also is going on about uh, managing uh, regional operations from Singapore as well. So thank you. Thank you, Mankit. Yes, we are, we're watching with keen interest how Singapore manages the reopening. We've seen other countries uh, in East and Southeast Asia uh, also reopening recently and others about to do so. Uh, and fingers across that uh, you don't have the experience uh, like in some other parts of the world where reopening uh, has uh, has led to uh, an increase in infections um, and sometimes uh, you know, reimposition of some of the um, uh, restrictions. Uh, I, I'd, like, I'd like to now turn to Shahamin, uh, who, just to recall, is the chair of the Global Compact Networks in Asia and the Pacific. And I'd really be interested in hearing from you. Uh, about the, the programming priorities of the Global Compact on supply chain sustainability and, and also, Shahamin, how you see companies in supply chains managing the turbulence that we've witnessed in the first two quarters of 2020. Thank you, Bert. Uh, thank you for the other speakers. Uh, I think it's a very interesting discussion because I think those that are most vulnerable are the supply chains. And uh, as part of the UN Global Compact uh, local networks, all our countries in Asia Pacific are facing similar challenges due to COVID-19. Uh, initially, we already saw there were a lot of hurdles that SMEs had to face. And these are legal uh, le regulatory systems, as well as access to finance, access to market linkages, and of course, with a uh, pandemic such as this, they are put in the last seat in the business cycle. So we need to actually look that, uh, at the issues that they are facing, because as my earlier speaker said, there's loss of jobs. We have to retain those jobs. How are we going to do that? Because there's no customer demand for the products and services. And also look at the areas where we are most hit. If you look at Asia Pacific, uh, we can see, of course, the hospitality sector, the airline sectors are hit, as well as the, the, you know, the apparel, the garments, the consumer goods sector. And uh, I think Global Compact, through its local networks over the years, has been actually trying to highlight the critical role that we need to engage in with the SME's sustainability agenda. And the SDGs, which already is in place, and the bigger companies are already engaged with this, uh, the, implementing the SDGs. But yet, we still see very few companies are engaging with their supply chains. So where can we put the thrust? And that's where the global context is put into the local context. And that's where UNGC can make the difference. We've already created a tool called the SME Toolkit, which was uh, developed by UN Global Compact and the local networks and piloted in one of the Asia Pacific regions, that is Bangladesh. And we worked with one of the biggest banks, the local banks in the country, BRAC Bank, 
which works with over 15,000 SMEs. And we did a sort of need analysis. And we found out that the main concerns were access to finance for the SMEs, access to knowledge, to technical know-how of business, regulatory systems did not actually uh, you know, give them that freedom of uh, looking into their uh, sustainability for their business. And if bigger companies don't come to the rescue, I think COVID-19 will have an enormous impact, which already we can see. Uh, they, you know, in countries across Asia Pacific, we have seen that a lot of joblessness, unemployment, government is giving their utmost to uh, injecting funds into the economy, but is that sustainable? So companies actually have to take this initiative in their own hands and look at how they can engage more with their supply chains. I know that a lot of the companies in the northern countries are already doing that, but we need to look at our region, how Asia Pacific can do that. And the toolkit that we developed through the UNGC is a very strong toolkit, which we can engage with our supply chains and also with the bigger companies to work along their supply chain and be, be beyond that. So looking at sustainability of a big company will never help if we do not engage and look at the issues of decent work, look at the issues of uh, labor standards, environmental compliance. And these are the things that actually keep companies from going into the global market. We have to share with our, our other focus that what are the issues at hand? Where can we actually give support? And through the UNGC, I think this is a very good platform where companies who are already UNGC members are in the right side of the game. And we can develop the SMEs through this process. Thank you, Barb. Shahamed, thank you very much for that. Uh, you know, I think that um, uh, it's, it's very useful to, to appreciate uh, for this conversation the, the real importance of addressing supply chains that have uh, been disrupted during the pandemic. Uh, and the importance of supply chains to SMEs. Uh, I'd like to thank you for also raising the um, important point that companies that engage strategically with their supply chains boost their credibility and recognition among key stakeholder groups. Now, with the introductory remarks uh, now complete, and I thought uh, all of you contributed very helpfully and substantively to the, the beginning of a, a a even richer uh, conversation. I wanted to, to launch um, a further discussion off with uh, a general question that's not directed to any of you individually. So uh, feel free to, to hop in if you have some reflection on this one. Uh, in particular, this being the first question, what sustainability hotspots uh, across supply chains has COVID-19 exposed in Southeast Asia? And, and how can companies and their suppliers work together to address these hotspots? And just to go a step further, how can uh, initiatives be worked down to the second and, and third tier of suppliers? So who would be interested in tackling this? What sustainable uh, sustainability hotspots across the supply chain has, has COVID-19 um, exposed? Maybe I'll give it a shot. Uh, I, Thank you. I, I will raise a, a, a Singapore example. Uh, and, 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 and this is really what Shamin talked about in terms of the relationship between uh, big companies and small companies and, and they feed off each other for them to be sustainable. Uh, and this is the, the relationship and the tension between landlords and tenants in Singapore as a result of the lockdown. You, you see, as a result of this, of the lockdown, our shops cannot open, our restaurants cannot open, and, and therefore they, 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 are, they were bleeding, and yet they had to pay rent, you know? And the landlords were not quite, uh, you know, not willing to pass the rental rebates to, to the tenants because uh, 
uh, they say that they were also being squeezed by the banks as well. They, they got to make their, their mortgage payment. So uh, government has stepped in to help in terms of giving the rental rebates to the landlord, but the landlords were not passing it to the tenants. So the tenants were quite furious because these were all not passed on and not passed, and some of them passed on with condition. So uh, in the end, uh, lobby groups were formed uh, amongst the tenants and they lobbied very strongly and uh, against this. And what happened was that uh, it was not a solution that uh, I myself would want, but it was a solution uh, that government decided to legislate. Uh, government decided to legislate to make sure that, uh, first of all, the landlord passed the rebates straight on to the, the tenants. And on top of that, now there's another law for the government to uh, for the uh, for for landlords to provide uh, cash grants to their tenants if the tenants have suffered uh, up to a thirty five percent revenue drop in the month of April and May this year compared to the similar months last year. So it was actually what government did was it went in and actually interfered uh, with an existing lease arrangement and require landlords to actually give back some rental rebate to to, uh, to uh, the tenant. So I think what it has exposed uh, in Singapore uh, really is, I think it's a realization that, you know, uh, you can't have a mall which only, you know, where the, where the, ben the, the landlord benefit without, without, without tenants, without good operating tenants. So, uh, unfortunately, in this case, we were not able to put this symbiotic relationship early enough. And the government, in order to solve a situation, uh, because the tenants were bleeding, uh, they decided to, 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 to legislate. I think it's a, it's a deep lesson learned uh, for us uh, that really to go forward uh, uh, between big businesses and small businesses, you really need to, to collaborate. You really need to uh, partner and work together synergistically. Otherwise, the government will come in with a heavy hand and, and legislate. And in the case of Singapore, it did. Uh, we, we, we do not like the regulations and, 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 and laws because they can be brought. Uh, they can introduce a regulatory cost. But in the case of Singapore, I think this is what has happened, even in a highly developed economy. I think it has exposed uh, uh, one particular hotspot uh, uh, in our in in our corporate sector. Yeah. I'll make it. Thank you for that. Want to ask uh, any of the other panelists want to to weigh in with their own uh, thoughts on sure. other hotspots uh, yep. in this area? Peter. Yes, if I can, please uh, build, build on on make it. Um, I think the UN, UN has come out with a very good report um, that most of you probably will be familiar with as to what are the social economic impacts of COVID-19, right? And, and the devastating effect potentially or, or realistically on, on both formal and informal economies. Um, and that's, you know, of course, unemployment, uh, as, as mentioned earlier, uh, is, is a great concern resulting from this whole crisis. Um, is that the impact, I would say, on, on the first SEG, that of no poverty, right? We know, we know that uh, um, inequality is not good for sustainability agenda. So that's, first of all, uh, a concern. How do we make sure people do not, segments of society do not fall beyond, be below the poverty line? Uh, how do we keep food security uh, going? Um, if, I, if I look at, at ourselves, I think we've we felt critically in need you know, to play a role there. Uh, we are in the food chain uh, with our nutrition portfolio. Uh, there's been tremendous effort uh, from our supply chain people, from our operators. But honestly, uh, going beyond the extra mile is, is done a statement as to what these people have done to keep plants going and as, as a result of that, keep supply chains going for uh, the benefit of food security. Um, I think if you look at supply chains, we've seen many decades of optimization, um, really driving costs out. And frankly, uh, this has come at a cost that has previously been undisclosed, right? We've taken buffers out. Uh, that now uh, becomes a, a real hot topic, agility. And with that, and I think it was brought up uh, earlier, how do we better connect our supply chains, including through new digital ways of working? I think that's, that's going to be critical. Uh, agility will be uh, really a new imperative. 
There's also a bright spot, I would say, potentially a bright spot and a dark spot. Uh, recently, I sat on a panel, and if I would ask anybody uh, for an estimate as to how many people have been working from home this time, any idea? How many, how many people globally? Any guess? It's been more than 2 billion people. Um, mm. So we've, we've enjoyed cleaner skies everywhere in, in big cities. Uh, so we've proven that actually uh, that we can deliver uh, cleaner air by reducing carbon uh, output. That, of course, has potentially, uh, you know, how do we now make sure that we capture some of these learnings, that, that we can work more virtually for the benefit of individual well-being and the, individual, and, and the, the benefit of the planet? And of course, the dark side that we need to make care, take care of is like 20 to 30 percent more efficient virtual ways of working. How do we make sure this does not lead to job losses? Uh, and innovation will have to play a big role there. Peter, thank you for that. Uh, and mentioning uh, this working from, from home, uh, this harkens back to uh, Vijay's uh, introductory remarks. Uh, I think you were about to say something on this. Please go ahead. Yes. Um... Basically, uh, none of us are experts here because this is something that's not happened uh, previously, so to speak. So to be able to come up with reports of any kind is interesting and I'm sure very entertaining. But the reality out there is this so-called new norm is not something that we have come to terms with yet. And uh, I am not a big fan of governments um, uh, getting involved in, in the economy, so to speak, because it has never proven to be uh, sustainable in the long run. The reality is that uh, businesses have to evolve. The reality is that uh, there has to be, you know, give and take, which has been a tradition of trade going back, you know, to, for centuries. So if it's about, uh, in the case of uh, Menkit's remarks regarding rentals and um, uh, landlords, I mean, I appreciate and empathize, but there are businesses that need to basically change the way they have been doing their business all this time. The, the reality has to bite in that, that moving forward will have to be a hybrid. They cannot just rely on a mall and people walking in. Malls may not be something that we need to, to see or uh, may not be part of the landscape in the next decade or so. Things are changing and they are going to be changing uh, in, in my mind uh, permanently. So now coming back to uh, what we had to do in our, in our case, uh, in essence, uh, this had to basically, we had to re-engineer everything we had done. So the first few weeks of, of the COVID uh, was devastating for everyone, including us, uh, sales took a dive. But then after that, just as any other internet company and, and uh, dispatch companies and companies in the supply chain, some of them have taken off. Uh, they have been seeing triple digit, you know, sales moving through uh, the last couple of months. And we have been one of those have been fortunate enough to be able to change fast enough that our sales basically has started to, you know, surpass the norm, so to speak, within the digital space. But uh, we are also in hotels and we are also have a university here in Malaysia that has taken a hard hit, both the university as well as the hotels. The hotels, obviously, uh, you know, all shut down so far and we are having to come to terms with the workforce that we have to somehow maintain at the, at the leaner but necessary level. So we had to come down to basically working out with the people that we absolutely need and, uh, you know, the demands that each of the locations require to maintain uh, and try and keep the hotels in place till after this is over. The interesting thing is um, working from home. This is an interesting challenge because, as Peter says, 2 billion people have been working from home. Now, that means that, in essence, the companies, particularly here in Asia, had to redesign their KPIs. They had to redesign how we monitor work and how we expect results. Uh, not something that they have been used to all this time. So it has been a major challenge. But... Moving ahead, you see, the one thing that's common among all of us speaking right now, we are essentially from the last century. Now, the, the, the moving forward, the new norm, the so-called millennials, the centennials, the people who are buying and buying online, so to speak, the people who are sustaining us across 30, 30 40-odd countries, 
is the millennials, the centennials, the new generations, the people to whom the new norm is not that new. You know, for us, we are just adapting to doing business online like this. Having a meeting like this is something new to me as opposed to flying into New York to have a chat with you guys in a, in a panel. But they, on the other hand, with Instagram and Snapchat and what have you out there, have been doing this from the time they have been you know, able to crawl. So they are adapting fast. Now on the retail side of things, uh, it's amazing because just if so many companies have closed down and some of them permanently, obviously, there have been so many companies that have been opening up during this period. People who have taken advantage of this you know, current COVID, so to speak, because they're operating from the house they're operating you know, on a smaller scale, delivering things you know, to people. Uh, I have uh, my you know, vegetable sellers in the market right now who are basically doing everything by, by iPhone, you know, by WhatsApp. So they video whatever vegetables they have, send it to us. We pick what we want and send to the house. Amazing as it is. And Malaysia uh, you know, has been good in terms of recovery. Uh, we are down to single digits uh, as of the last few days. We have a great DG who has been uh, holding the fort quite well. So uh, hopefully, you know, there's not going to be a second wave. But the fact of the matter is we need to come to terms with a new reality. And the new re reality is going to be that we're going to have to treat planet Earth a lot better because uh, she's needed this reprieve. She's needed this break, you know. But in Malaysia, I can tell you one thing. We have had blue skies, which is something... You know, we don't generally see this of year for the last decade or so. We have blue skies, we have blue water, incredible. That river's running right through the center of the city. Uh, so clean, you know, literally, you know, coming borderline pristine. So with the, us coming back into, you know, the norm, so to speak, we need to come to terms that we need to change certain things permanently moving forward, you know, dealing with workers, allowing landlords and retailers to come to their own terms because some businesses are not sustainable. And this is the rock that they're meeting. And this is the place where they need to decide whether they need to continue in the fashion they are or coming up with a hybrid a way of dealing with uh, commercial retailing. So that's another thing. And the more important thing is actually the worker-employer relationship. That's going to be something very significant in how that is going to play out, particularly here in Southeast Asia, where working from home, working on a laptop in the beach is not something that people see as work per se. Work for them has to be something regimented, clocking in, clocking out, and so on. And we need to snap out of that and recognize that work can be done anywhere. And that's something that we have learned to do ourselves. We have learned to tone down and, and basically target what we need in terms of deadlines and deliverables. And uh, surprisingly, surprisingly, our workforce has actually uh, collaborated, worked with us, cooperated with us, and responded rather well. So we are on, in terms of the digital aspect of the company, we are truly coming forward. In terms of the educational aspect, now lectures are being done online but what really took me by surprise is how they now are doing examinations online they you know where uh, kids basically have to get into a room uh, pan the room with the camera make sure no one is there the invigilator sits across the other side and a full-on university examination is being done on a one-to-one -one basis right across the country and these are things that we are yes just to say, sorry these it's, are it's things we are changing to Sure, and and uh, the whole movement to digital out of necessity uh, is going to clearly influence the the way we come out of this uh, pandemic and how how we do business and how we study and how we interact. Let, let me just let me draw Shahimin back into the conversation. I wanted to actually ask her what opportunities she sees uh, in um, uh, in terms of um, supply chains becoming more sustainable. Uh, from a social and environmental or good governance point of view, what, what are the opportunities um, that are unlocked when supply chains become more sustainable? Uh, first, we have to go back to the situation we're in now. 
uh, you've seen in different countries around the world, when they were sourcing from uh, Asia, Asian countries, there was a standstill because there was also a lot of hiccups because uh, orders were in place, orders were not, uh, you know, uh, taken into account. They, because of the pandemic, there were no consumers, so orders were stuck and the businesses suffered. So we have to actually go back to where do we stand when we talk about people and planet and human rights, decent work. All this comes into uh, this whole debate of uh, social, environmental, economic uh, issues. And I think what's important is sustainability. When we're talking about the SDGs, sustainability is not one issue or you can't pick out five issues from there. It is, is it, it is intertwined. One is impacted with the other. So I think what uh, some of the speakers said about no poverty, no hunger, all these issues, decent work, you know, infrastructure, uh, you know, all these issues are related to each other. And when we talk about sustainability, if our supply chains are not sustainable, if we cannot give them those basic uh, demands that they have, the basic rights, then I think in the long run, the bigger businesses will suffer. And I think what I believe is that the UN Global Compact, through its local network, is doing a tremendous job in actually capturing that critical mass. Because as you know, in these countries, we our major businesses, are, the bigger ones are a handful, but we have a major mass of SMEs that are operating there. And the conditions are not the same. If you look at the working conditions, if you look at the standards, they're not the same. And we need to actually, when we talk about planet Earth, saving the planet Earth, we talk about environment, compliance. We know that there's a lot of certifications that companies have to go through at a global level. But what our UNGC members are doing and what we also propose and advocate is not everything can be taken at a northern level, at a global level. It has to be localized. We have to look at the local context. We cannot forget what the government's rules and regulations are. And it differs from country to country, region to region. And what we want to advocate is responsible business behavior. And responsibility implies all those things that you just talked about, social, environmental, and economic. Because we talk about the issues of living wage, uh, minimum wage. These are also different issues that are coming up in the region, which is debated for the last 10 years. But where are we there? And at, at this moment with COVID-19, who is suffering? The SMEs are suffering. We see uh, they're becoming marginalized, they're becoming vulnerable. And I think uh, we have to actually create a pathway where the SMEs are sustainable for the longer term of the bigger businesses. If we want bigger businesses to survive in these aftermath of today, it's COVID-19, tomorrow it might be something else, we don't know. But we have to take into account what are the ways we can engage with our supply chain in a partnership approach that will look into what are the gaps? How can we as big companies fulfill those gaps? We as UN fulfill these gaps. And I think that also requires capacity building and skill development. Thank you, Bart. Simon, thank you for that. Um, Mink, yeah, sure, please go ahead, Peter. Yeah, if I, if I can build on that, I mean, uh, um, you know, clearly, clearly sustainable supply chains will be best positioned to grow, right? If you look at investors, individual or institutional, green financing is, is, is becoming clearly a, a much more a dominant um, issue, right? And, and building on Fiji is also, yeah, the new consumers are who? Millennials, right? They, they clearly have sustainability more on their layer, so that builds again to the growth prospects for sustainable uh, supply chains. You, you yourself mentioned uh, about, uh, Bart, about the social license to operate. And, and I think it's no coincidence, right? And I think, again, that reflects the earlier comments. Uh, average years of corporations is down to about 20 years, right? Lifespan, down from 60 in 1950. Why is that, right? Is that a coincidence? I don't think so, right? Um, and then maybe the last comment there also about uh, the, the power shift due to social media, right? Uh, if you are part of a sustainable supply chain, you'll be so much better prepared for active pitch approaches, 
uh, for the damage potentially caused, caused by social media. Uh, so there's many, many opportunities um, that, that are coming from being more sustainable as a supply chain. And I think also it's been studied for Asia alone to create by 2030, what is it, $5 trillion uh, of potential additional revenues, 230 million, uh, 230 million new jobs. So there's, there's overwhelming uh, justification to do so as, as, as supply chains, regardless of size, location uh, of companies. Peter, let me just yeah, uh, if ask I may. Peter. Uh, let me just let me just ask Peter a question before we're coming uh, moving on. Sure. When does when does one, at a very say personal level, evolve to influence and help shape business activities for sustainable impact? I mean, do you in your in your own experience, do you recall any triggers in your life? Yeah, I, I was part of uh, in Singapore. We have uh, um, supported by the government and uh, and Temasek Foundation the. Uh, Human Capital Leadership Institute. I was I was privileged to uh, to be to take part in that about ten years ago. Uh, I was in my forties, uh, mid forties, I guess. And and I think the question that, that was very very powerfully asked there was like, um, you know, at what point of time in your career or as a business for that matter, uh, do you complement what you do well, which is typically managing for results, by leading for purpose? And it's a question that's always stayed with me because I think. Throughout my career, I, I think uh, I got to a certain point because I was able to deliver results. Um, is that enough? Is it enough as an individual? Is it enough as a company? Uh, answer uh, ultimately has got to be that it's not, right? Uh, I think, it's, it's, again, it reflects earlier comments. We need, as company, regardless of size, um, uh, location, uh, as individuals, as leaders, we are not complete unless we do both, right? Unless we deliver uh, on the on the triple bottom line the people element the profit element and the planet element thanks for thanks for sharing that personal experience uh, was it Menkhet or VJ who wanted to weigh in next yeah uh, just I want to weigh in on a quick point uh, on, on on supply chain uh, I think for many uh, companies uh, SMEs and large companies in in this part of the world uh, the, the pandemic has accelerated the shifting of uh, supply chain uh, from China. Uh, not that uh, we're going to abandon China uh, because it's such a, a big economy, uh, but uh, many, many companies are looking at a China plus one strategy. So, so supply chains are, are shifting and shifting out of China into Southeast Asia in, in particular. So countries like Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, uh, uh, will benefit and and actually that that is an opportunity because uh, it means additional investments uh, in into this country I think and and that is good and also because of uh, 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 governments are now putting uh, resilience in supply chain uh, as as a uh, important policy uh, per prerogative particularly for uh, items like food like for medical supplies so there are actually incentives for uh, for from government for for those supplies chain to be kept uh, near and resilient and within the company, so within the country. So in Singapore, for example, uh, suddenly we, uh, we we are looking at maybe we could grow 30% of our vegetables and food in Singapore, and we are incentivized to do that. So during the lockdown period, uh, I've got a box of uh, freshly grown vegetables from one of our uh, uh, SMEs, which were doing uh, uh, doing packaging. You know, now they are growing, growing vegetables. So... So th those are sort of the new opportunities that we do. And, 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 and it's good that if we can not just do it within one country, we can do it together, you know, together with other Southeast Asian countries, do it together with Australia, New Zealand, so that uh, we can actually make sure that mutually we can uh, make our supply chain within these countries that we cooperate uh, resilience as well. So I, I think there lies actually quite a lot of uh, new opportunities in terms of creating uh, not just local, but uh, bilateral resilient supply chain amongst companies. Thank you. Vijay, I have a Can question for you, but give me I... just a moment. Give me just a moment yes. because I wanted to follow up with uh, Ben Kitt real quick. So I'm getting through a separate channel, some questions from the audience. There are people listening to you uh, and I'm, uh, yes. I'm getting some questions. Um, and one of them's from uh, Irene Sim. Uh, her company is not identified. She's in Copenhagen, Denmark. And she had a question for you, um, uh, Mankit, about the Singapore Business Federation. Specifically, how is the Federation helping SMEs survive this pandemic? 
and change their business models to be more sustainable? Maybe just answer briefly so uh, we can get to VJ. Uh, we, we, we tell them that, look, after beyond survival, you have to transform. Uh, so, for example, uh, retailers, uh, we help them get onto e-commerce platforms. We have helped 600 SMEs get onto platforms like Lazada, Shopee. Uh, 10,000 of our uh, uh, restaurants are now doing, in addition, they no more walk-in business, no more dining business. They are on uh, delivery platforms. So we are helping them get onto this uh, digital platform. Uh, and we, are, uh, we have business resilience uh, classes with consultants to teach our SME to look at how they can build a resilient business model going forward. So um, many, many things that we are doing for, for our SME members in the Singapore Business Federation. Thank you for that. Vijay, you wanted to make an intervention, but uh, let me I'll take this opportunity to also ask you a question. When you started out in business many years ago, working, I believe, in the Philippines in the late 90s, uh, a country that's close to my heart, having spent much of the last two decades there, you if I understand correctly, you were more in the supplier mode, uh, getting things started. Uh, and over time, you've, you've been a very successful businessman. You built up this conglomerate working in many countries. And now you, in turn, have many suppliers that are supplying uh, your various lines of business. How has this affected your perception of, of the, the difficulty that suppliers in Southeast Asia are confronting uh, through this economic and health crisis? Uh, if you could offer a word on that, in addition to the other point you wanted to make. Well, in terms of suppliers, in, uh, to put it uh, simply, suppliers are uh, just like any other business people right now, needing to totally redesign the wheel, as it were. So they need to, first of all, recognize that they need to reform, they need to transform, and more importantly, they need to conform. Because the world moving ahead is very targeted in a totally different fashion, as it were, from the one we just left behind. So the thing that you need to look at is the sustainability issue. Now, in terms of our suppliers, we have come up with a code of ethics that we have drawn up with a, uh, uh, with a headliner of one planet, one purpose, one people. Now, to try and get that message across to suppliers has not been easy because they have years of habits that they need to break. And moving forward, there are certain requirements now that we have been put into this code that requires our products to be sustainable, part of a circular economy that we can basically look at uh, putting these products out in the marketplace. And people today, like you say, the millennials and centennials are people who look for products in a different fashion. And what they want in a product is not necessarily, you know, price alone. So the factor of profit, though important, needs to be taken probably in the second place to these three factors. So the other thing that, that needs to happen is that entrepreneurs, suppliers are entrepreneurs at the end of the day. And entrepreneurs do not actually function very well with any kind of a safety net, so to speak. So having the government you know, give them aids and support and so on and so forth doesn't make an entrepreneur any stronger. Entrepreneurs survive despite the odds, not you know, in favor of, but despite the odds. So they need to basically create themselves into a brand new animal, so to speak, moving ahead into this new economy, this new world that we are going to be all stepping into. And one of the factors they have to take a look at is completely sustainability, sustainability, sustainability. So that is something that they have to take into account. Now, more important, I think, is the fact that, you know, uh, we are different culturally. I agree with uh, uh, with what she was saying a little earlier, we are different in every culture, in every nation. Even if we are bordering nations, we are culturally different. But the fact of the matter is the millennials or this new generation of people are connected in fashions that you cannot even believe. Their ability to, con to create a culture that is global has been happening. And it's showing in the buying patterns that we are seeing. And therefore, we have not only had to change the modality of how we sell, but we also have to change the products and the modality of how we obtain them. So sustainability has become key to us moving forward in many ways. Shahamin, we have a question in, um, from Faroz Nadar, who's uh, in Malaysia. How, how do we balance developing countries on the ground realities 
with Western expectations for sustainable development? Interesting question. Thank you, Bart. Uh, I think what here we need to actually look at is that the local context in these countries, as I just said, that, you know, in the Asia Pacific zone, the countries have different cultures, different traditions, different expectations, even from, you know, from governments, the role of governments are very unique and different than the northern countries. So uh, uh, overall mainstream prescription will not be applicable here. For sustainability of supply chains, we need to look at innovation at the local context by uh, the local businesses and the government instruments that are available. We need to look at uh, reformation, transformation. And I think what is very interesting that my earlier speaker just said, that it's a new world out there. The world is changing. The new generation of entrepreneurs have already come into a situation facing COVID-19 that they will look at social economic compliance as a, 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 an environmental compliance as a necessity. It would no longer be a need of the day. It would have to start with that need. I think that's very important. And uh, I feel that we are getting there, I hope, through this COVID-19, we can actually realize that we cannot do business as usual. And su sustainability of supply chains and the resilience of supply chains is an important agenda that we need to have collective, collective action on. Jamin, thank, thank you. you for that. We are, if, we if, are if actually, I, in terms can, of time, running to the near, near the end of our session. And I wanted to go to each of you and ask if you had a, a final concluding remark uh, something, uh, words of wisdom, uh, something that you didn't have an opportunity to say earlier, if you could briefly uh, take a, a minute or less uh, just to share that, uh, that thought. Let's start with Peter before going to uh, some of the others. Go on, yeah. Peter. I use, it, I use it as an opportunity to build on what was said earlier. Um, this is not a Western issue. It's not a Western challenge, right? Un unless we solve um, the, the challenges ahead, we will all get impacted by the next crisis, which is the climate crisis, right? Um, so we cannot sit by and watch melt, uh, ice caps melt, coral go, go to bits, uh, because ultimately it is the poorer societies in the world that probably will suffer most. Um, so question we have to ask ourselves in, in, in leadership, in business, what are we doing? Is it, is it the consequence of our future, a better future? Is it the consequence of our past? And what is our, where do we stand as a business, small, medium, large, what is our role to play there? Thank you, Peter. Menkit. Uh, we should take this opportunity in the economic recovery to really build a better society. So I wish, for example, in the tourism industry, which is very important and, uh, and many uh, affects many SMEs in Southeast Asia, that they will build a tourism industry that is more eco-friendly and more sustainable and take this opportunity to, to do that. Now is the time. Thank you. BJ. We need to wake up to the new reality. We simply need to conform to the new needs of the day. We need to reform the way we are doing things and transform ourselves into a brand new entity. And to me, uh, I'd like to repeat what I say to all my suppliers, one planet, one people, one purpose. That would be the way forward. Brian, in my thank opinion, you. Great message there. Uh, Shaman, yeah. please. Yeah, I think what we need to do is work together. It's no one region. It's no one planet as such. We have to work together in a combined effort so that we can work with not only the global supply chains, but look at avenues for innovation, because already a lot of innovation is taking place through COVID-19 aftermath. And this situation has given opportunities, yet we have challenges to face. And we have to work together. We have to be on the same wavelength as, as uh, one nation. And uh, with the SMEs, I feel it's very important that now we have to do policy advocacy because if governments don't change, if the governance structure doesn't change, then we cannot help the multi-stakeholders that are engaged here. And I think 
all of us and all those companies that are on board the UN Global Compact, they can actually start engaging proactively with their supply Come chains. In. I'll have and to, I'll have to look at there and tire. thank you all for the contribution today. We're wrapping up this session thank now. Thank you. Have thank a good you. rest thank of you. your day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Much. Very much. Thank you My name is Mark Moody Stewart, and I've been involved in the Global Compact since Kofi Annan issued his challenge to uh, businesses to try and put a human face on globalization. The UN in general thought that the UN was the business of governments. It was absolutely revolutionary for the UN to reach out to business. And it was very brave of Kofi Annan. I propose that you, the business leaders here gathered in Davos, and we, the United Nations, initiate a global compact of shared values and principles which will give a human face to the global market. I call on you, individually through your firms and collectively through your business associations, to embrace, support, and enact a set of core values in the areas of human rights, labor standards, and environmental practices. Kofi Annan made this quite impassioned call. And part of his genius was that he didn't just challenge business, he also added in civil society and labor organizations. And that was absolutely fundamental, because if he just said business and left other sectors of society on the sidelines to monitor and point at business, it would not have worked, I think. An essential part was that those bits of society also said, we have to work with business to deliver it. And that was something quite revolutionary as well. It was the idea that you could build into your business this DNA of supporting the objectives of the United Nations. When we launched this initiative, there were probably five companies in the world who would say in their policies and what they're doing that human rights matter for them. Gradually, uh, a whole movement has emerged. The response was almost overwhelming. We have to find practical ways to strengthen the social and environmental pillars. And this can be done in complement to economic expansion, not in contradiction to. And that is the basic philosophy of the company. The development of the MDGs was, of course, linked in some ways to the progress of the Global Compact. But the MDGs were fundamentally developed by governments. And that's the, the huge change and an evidence of the role of business that the Sustainable Development Goals have been developed with massive input by business all around the world. Kofi Annan made the speech in Davos, and business is now accepted by the majority of the UN as an essential partner. And equally, there's been change on the business side. Businesses have begun to realize that they cannot do it without government. And so now we have Sir Mark Moody Stewart on the line. Thank you for joining us, Sir Mark. It's a pleasure. In that video clip, we heard the then Secretary General Kofi Annan uh, referencing the principles of the United Nations Global Compact, the principles that he was asking uh, private sector leaders to sign up to, uh, human rights, labor rights, and uh, protecting the environment. When was uh, the 10th principle added and why? Originally, uh, when Kofi Annan made that speech, uh, we'd seen a draft of the speech which Gail Kell and John Ruggie had uh, drafted, and it had a reference to corruption in it. And when I listened to the speech, uh, the reference had been dropped. Uh, I think actually Kofi Annan was absolutely right, because uh, as Secretary General, I think Secretaries General come under attack for going outside what member states have asked them to do. And he was able to say, well, I was, when they said, what are you doing talking to business? He was able to say, well, I'm only asking them to follow the conventions which you sign. And at that time, there was in fact no UN convention against corruption. 
So we had work to do to, first of all, the UN had work to do to get a convention. And then when that convention existed, we were able to, to take put on a tenth principle of the fight against corruption. And that was quite difficult to do because one or two companies said, hey, you're moving the goalposts. And, uh, you know, we signed up to nine principles and we promised to report on them and now you're adding a tenth. Thank you. So we've had those ten principles since then, since 2003. Um, uh, they haven't changed since. Um, do you feel that they're still relevant today, those ten principles? I feel they're absolutely relevant, and they form the basis with those principles on human rights, environment, labor conditions, working conditions, and anti-corruption. You cover pretty well the whole waterfront. And what happens now is in 2015, the UN brought in the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 of them, and we always say, get the basis right. The, the, uh, the principles are how you do it, and the sustainable development goals are what we need to do. And I think that still holds. And it's important that corruption should be in there, because, of course, there isn't a specific sustainable development goal on corruption. There's, there's one on rule of law and sound governance under which corruption or anti-corruption comes. But it's very important that we get the principles embedded and reported on, and then what we're going to do building on that. If you just jump straight into the SDGs, you have people saying, look at all the great things I'm doing on, on goal, whichever. Uh, but actually, it may be built on clay. Right. So you were in the room that day in Davos in 1999 when Kofi Annan made the speech proposed the UN Global Compact. You've seen us grow from very small beginnings. Um, I think you were one of the CEOs that immediately signed up to be part of the UN Global Compact at the time. How have you seen the initiative grow over the years? Well, one of the reasons that we saw the draft of the speech was that, that uh, Gail Kell and, and Kofi Annan and John Ruggie wanted to make sure that somebody would sign up to it. So, so I think 30 or 40 companies were uh, encouraged to, to be ready to say yes, with pleasure. Uh, and we've seen it grow. And I think one of the reasons that we've seen it grow, not as fast as we'd hoped, is that the Global Compact has some unique selling points. There are many splendid organizations dealing with sustainable development. There's only one which is firmly based on principles, says companies have to report on those principles, and has teeth. If you don't report on the principles, you're delisted. But in addition to that, it's from the beginning, Kofi's genius, I think, was that he called on civil society and labor unions. So built into the board, the governance structure of the, the, the global compact, is this multi-stakeholderism. And that last point is that it's not just for big companies. Some organizations work on the top 1,000, 2,000 big companies and their supply chains and think, job done. Job's not done like that. We need every company in every country of the world. And that's where the local networks come in. So I think we've grown. It's quite tough because the conditions, it's not just sign up and forget about it or sign up and pay your fee. Uh, it's sign up and really commit to doing something and reporting publicly, which is a tough hurdle. And But the growth has been enormously impressive and very encouraging in local networks all around the world. Yeah, we have 68 local networks now. They're working with companies at the national and the local level. Um, uh, how, how do you see their contribution to this initiative? It's absolutely fundamental, their contribution. There have been times when we had more local networks because, again, it sounds easy. Let's have a local network. But actually, we need conditions and discipline. And that's something I think we now have. Uh, so a clear relationship between the center and the networks. 
the dream, for me, the dream of the local networks is that in each and every country, you've grown a multi-stakeholder organization which can help encourage governments. It's, it's a coalition which can, with trust, because it's not just one sector, with trust, encourage governments to really move forward fast on the sustainable development goals, but also on the basic principles, while so encouraging them, while where they are not doing a good job, speaking out from a position of coalition and strength. That's a dream. We will get there. And in some places and some countries, I think we, we're making good progress. This summit will address three global crises, the, uh, the global health crisis uh, brought on by this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the climate crisis, an ongoing crisis that we must get right, and an inequality crisis. Um, how, do you, how do you feel, uh, the, what is the role of the private sector in addressing these, these global challenges, would you say? I think that they, clearly we have a, a role in, in all of them. Uh, it's very much focused at the moment on, on COVID. But if you look at inequality, we in businesses have a real job to do. And to look at, at the differentials, it's very easy for CEOs to say, yeah, we worry about differentials. But leaders of companies have to look at the distribution of remuneration within their own organization. What's the range? And the range has grown and widened enormously over the past uh, 20 years or so. Prior to that, it was relatively static. And that's fundamentally a problem. And it's difficult to put the genie back in the bottle. And it cannot be addressed simply by philanthropy. We need to look at valuing the contribution. And out of COVID, of course, have come a realization that we as a society have not valued the contribution of many essential people, health workers, frontline workers, but not just them, uh, train drivers, people in society. Now, we in business understand that within our own business, but we don't always get it right. In fact, Unfortunately, as I say, the top has moved away from, from the, the middle and bottom. Uh, uh, and but so we Mark, have to um, yes, demonstrate you. that. You've seen uh, the UN Global Compact grow from infancy through uh, early years, the awkward teenage years. We're now 20 years old. What are your hopes for the future? My hopes rest on the local networks. If we could, in each and every country, have a really good functioning local network, an alliance of civil society, labor organizations, business, business-led, but uh, an alliance which could help steer society and, and, and guide governments and encourage governments to do the right things. I think an organization like that would be much more trusted than just business or any of the components on their own. That's my dream. Thank you very much, Sir Mark Moody Stewart. Thank you for joining us for the UN Global Compact 20th Anniversary Leaders Summit. Thank you, and congratulations on those fantastic academies you've been running.